Okay, great. Hey, everyone. So thank you to the V2 for that awesome introduction to the P2P in general. Um, what I wanted to talk about was focus on where we're at uh, as a project, uh, in great part in how we develop some of this stuff, and think through uh, the priorities that we have ahead so that we can set up ourselves um, to you know, pretty much scale a lot of the development and get to solve some of those really, really hard, hard issues. Right? So we're talking about, um, in, in the long term, we hope to bring about drastic improvements to how people use networking in their applications and platforms and systems. And it's totally achievable, but it will require a lot of work on very specific areas that um, we're getting ourselves set up to do, but we're not fully there yet. So I want to talk a bit about how we can, um, we can get there. Uh, I want to touch a bit on kind of vision and mission. Uh, I think David already covered this extensively, so I'm, I can, don't have to spend a lot of time on this at all. Um, this shares a lot with IPFS, um, just simply because this is where a lot of the project came out of, but, and over time it's going to become kind of its own identity. But um, I, I think this slide still captures uh, the ideas really well. We want a networking stack that supports the end, use, the end style distributed environment where you're not really depending on any kind of intermediaries at all. So the internet works that way. The web doesn't. Uh, and then a lot of other platforms don't. Uh, IoT doesn't. So, some parts of IoT work that way, others don't. Um, and it's pretty important for a lot of how we expect uh, computing to work in the future, or, or like the good visions of what we want computing to work like in the future, uh, to make sure that our networking stacks properly work in that way, and that our applications aren't accidentally smuggling in other models that are much more restrictive and uh, make our applications fail in, in circumstances where you know they become really where it would be extremely important for them to work. So think of disaster scenarios. Uh, if right now there was some major disaster um, in a city, uh, a lot of the normal communication applications that people use to talk to each other would suddenly stop working. Uh, a lot of the normal centralized messaging systems um, depend highly on a set of conditions uh, working. And if any one of those links in the chain breaks, the entire system go, uh, comes down. So that's not how the internet was designed. That's how modern web applications and, and mobile systems work. And so we need to go back, um, back to the old designs and you know, kind of like unwind and go down a different path. And so a lot of that is thinking through um, the hard problems in building those large scale platforms to work like the internet, which is much harder. Um, and then think through how can we build software libraries to enable those applications and systems to do it easily. Um, it's very easy today to build and depend on uh, cloud systems and to no do those normal architectures. But it wasn't easy at the beginning. People put in a lot of work and effort to make all of those libraries so that it is easy today. Um, we just have to do that for the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, type of things. Uh, worth Just keep this in mind. Uh, I think people that were around the last few days already kind of saw this. But just keep this in mind as you think about libp in general. Um, think about the probably vast majority of the internet doesn't have the level of connectivity that uh, the main uh, cities in, in, in the world have. Uh, it's highly mobile, uh, and that's something that we need to make more of a focus uh, in our projects. And uh, David already described these, the, this set of problems and so on. Um, I already covered all of this. this. These are the all the web problems from IPFS, a lot of them are just about the networking stack and how data is structured on top of that. Platform, same thing. Uh, th there's probably a lot more projects here, uh, but Lipid2P is gaining in, in kind of, is growing as a, as, a, as a system that people depend on. Um, and so we hope to, you know, in a year, have that grid expand quite a bit. And there's already a lot of that are not represented there, but uh, more will grow. I wanted to mention that there was kind of like, and in, an inversion, interestingly, where, where IPLD suddenly might actually become useful to Lipid2P as a, as a library. Um, this is you know, an, at, an, a, an attempt at a mission, not quite, uh, not quite there yet, but uh, we'll think through, we'll keep workshopping this, uh, I hope, um, but really think of making a networking stack, a modular networking stack, to make robust peer-to-peer -peer systems easy to build. Um, it is not easy to build robust peer-to-peer -peer systems today at all. Uh, so things like process addressing, as we covered, um, I think a, a key component 
of this modular idea is to get ourselves into a position where each of these things, which are substantially difficult, um, no, no worries. Uh, each of these things, which are substantially difficult to to do, so you know, think of crypto channels or um, distributed record stores or things like that, or peer routing in, in massive scales when you're dealing with billions of processes. Um, those things are hard enough already, and they it, it, it is important for us as a project to get ourselves in a position where we can attack each of those problems or you know a subset of them uh, kind of independently. So when people think about implementing something like a Coral DHT or you know some of the newer DHTs that, that have been designed in the last five years, um, they can just focus on that as a, as a problem and use whatever toolkit there is in Lib2P, but then provide whatever interface um, they need to so that other systems can start depending on that. And uh, right now, development in Lib2P is highly integrated across a lot of things, and so it's kind of difficult for, for people to do that. Um, but it's getting a lot better. So I think this year is way better than last year, and I think next year it will be e even easier. Um, I think I would be interested in talking to people around uh, this in the next couple of days about if you implemented a specific version of this, for example, the quick transport, how much did you have to worry about the rest of the Lib2P interfaces? And if you know, it's any kind of significant measure at all, then that's a problem that we, that we should fix. Uh, so that we want to get our development to a point where it is easy for people to drop into a specific piece and, and just build a new building block and then add, contribute it to the kit. Um, so I wanted to show some highlights. Uh, we split out planning from, from IPFS. So we've been on this like ongoing effort to like split out the library and, and so on. Um, and so uh, it required effort to just make sure that like really they're distinct projects and planning is happening separately. And uh, though there's a lot of integration and, and sharing of people, um, we really have two, two different threads. Uh, and this will help, especially all the other uh, people that are coming to depend on Lib2P to participate in the Lib2P ecosystem without having to worry about understanding or thinking about how IPFS organizes itself. Uh, implementations, it's exciting to have uh, Rust uh, added to the set. Uh, this was over the last year. And I think also over the last year, JS got to a level of, of uh, connectivity and, and support that you know, re remarkable improvements, especially in the browser and, and so on. And uh, Go got uh, massively more performant and also got quick. So that's a, you'll, you'll hear about more, more of that later on. We also, uh, you know, as we structured ourselves, uh, we're kind of beginning the formation of working groups. Uh, similar to what IPFS did last quarter, uh, now we're kind of doing it for Lib2P. Whoops, that's a IPFS fail. Uh, let me fix that. No, I'll fix it later. I won't waste your time. Um, so, you know, we have these kind of working groups budding. Um, there may be more later. I'll talk about some of, some of them. So with that, um, I wanted to talk about what we should think about focusing on in, in the next couple of quarters. And Mike has a, already done a lot of thinking and, and, and structuring of this, uh, and he'll talk about it later um, at some point during the conference, probably. Uh, but I wanted to give a preview of some of that and maybe even project to some ideas that we might think about uh, further beyond, so in 2019. Uh, a thing that I wanted to bring back from earlier in the week, uh, if you were around, uh, and if not, uh, then great, is that when you think about building a system, you have all these different dimensions to worry about and, and uh, get concerned, concerned with, and each take a lot of time. And uh, you know, each of these dimensions, like features, break out into a ton more. And you, know, you need you just growing the, the, the volume of cover over all of these uh, different dimensions uh, when you are building software just consumes a lot of time. And so getting to a really good level of completion with, on any of these dimensions uh, takes a while. And so if you want to ship something, you have to like, take a lot of shortcuts. Uh, and so we did that. And then you know, we got uh, things usable and, and dependable to some degree. Uh, but now we need to keep rolling that up and keep diving deep into each of these dimensions and improving things. So, um, leveling up our docs, leveling up our feature sets, leveling up testing and QA, leveling up performance, leveling up specs, and so on. And this isn't a, you know, we work on this for a while and then, you know, we get it to the, we max it out all the way to the end and like we're set. This is, you know, a continual thing that we think of it kind of like a spiral. We're like over time, we're like growing the, the cover. And as our team grows, then we can parallelize and we can, you know, different groups can, can attack different vectors. One other thing is that because Lib2P is highly modular, we could each of the different components, whether it's different implementations or different sub pieces, can 
proceed on their own at their own pace and their own rate to some degree, except for the things that are dependent on uh, as, a, as a group. So for example, things like interfaces, things like testing, um, things like documentation and examples, um, and communications and websites and, and so on. All of those common things have to be great um, f first, uh, so that each of the independent module implementations can uh, kind of follow their own trajectory and not have to be blocked by some, some dependency. Um, but encourage us to think about, about it like this, because somebody working on a new transport or somebody working on a new DHT or somebody working on uh, new pub sub implementation should have everything underneath um, that, that they need to build their implementation and, and so on, uh, and you know, proceed through their, their own um, development cycle without having to be blocked by, by the underlying uh, components. Uh, and, so, and so they can leverage some shared infrastructure. So uh, being able to run really large scale network tests or having a standard way of, of writing the docs or things like that. Uh, we we got to get, get in that. Um, also useful to uh, uh, think about the kernel shell and commands kind of structure from Unix. Um, this is pretty similar to how libp2p works, right? So you can think of the, the, the kernel of libp2p being the addressing and the, and the switching. Um, both right now, circuit switching. In the future, we might bring, uh, we will bring packet switching. Um, maybe someday, package switching. That's a story for another time. Uh, getting that—that that is effectively the kernel, um, and some of the interfaces uh, define kind of like the syscalls in a sense. Um, and then the shell, uh, and and you know the interface that people use to to use this thing, end up being like all of the individual like module interfaces. Uh, and so people th think of like mounting drivers into the kernel. Like think of each of the transports or each of the DHDs and so on as mounting a new driver into the kernel of Flippity P. Um, and then ideally systems can just uh, build on top. Uh, but, but again, this decoupling makes it easy for us to proceed in development in one, one area without having to worry about the rest of the project. Uh, I think right now we're not in a good, we're in an okay place, but we need to get better. Um, so leveling up on a lot of things and scaling our development. So um, uh, you know, one objective that we have for 2018 is uh, making Lipid2P a first class project. Uh, that means you know, some working group structure, a core working group to kind of coordinate all of it, uh, clearly articulated requirements uh, for different implementations, um, a great roadmap. That's something we're, we're, we're working on. Uh, and also increasing the, the, full, the amount of full-time dedicated people. Then uh, this is around quality and dependability. This, um, I want to talk m more with people about this, but just leveling up our, our, our work on these kinds of things, you know, getting correctness, higher performance, completeness, scalability, and so on. And uh, I wanted to touch on a couple of things here. One is um, visualizing protocols can become extremely useful to understand how to, how to work with them. So one project I I'm, 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 would be excited to, to think about during this year and either doing this year or next year um, is building a, a, a structure for people to be able to visualize things like a DHT um, or things like the, the um, uh, stream multiplexers and so on. Uh, here's an example of a visualization of a protocol. Uh, this is Filecoin. Um, and this is a visualization that's generated straight from the log output of, of uh, Filecoin nodes. So those are six Filecoin nodes that are all running in P, And we take the log output of those and consume, aggregate those logs, and then just visualize the logs. And so we get a trace of what it looks like to, to have a protocol run. And it's built in such a way that, this visualization is built in such a way that we can uh, just write all of those log outputs to a file, and then just play them back in the future. Now you can imagine things like controls here, being able to like freeze somewhere and be like, oh, what's happening here? Like, what is this weird message that like, I never expected? Um, and there's some amount of like custom visualization that you have to do per protocol. Like this is a visualization of Filecoin where you have a chain and you have like the market, uh, the storage market structure, and so on. Uh, something like a DHT would look pretty different. But some of the components might be reusable, and at least the the the, the architecture of the you know take all these log outputs and filter them in such a way, and you know th that kind of stuff is all reusable. So uh, this is effectively a lippy2p tool. This isn't really a Filecoin specific tool. Uh, the other thing around testing is that we need to start doing really large-scale tests. Like we need to get to a point where we are testing millions of nodes and get ourselves up, set up so that we can do testing with billions of nodes. Uh, this is Planet Lab. I don't know if you've, you're familiar with it. 
it's a large-scale testing environment uh, that Academia built a couple decades ago or more. Um, most academic peer-to-peer -peer systems were tested on this, uh, things like Coral, um, things like Academia probably, and, and so on. And we also have another version of this, the RIPE Atlas, for example, ships a lot of like little devices all over the world that are constantly measuring like different pieces of the internet. Um, and so here are two examples of groups that deployed a little bit of hardware all over the world and connected it in a network that allowed them to then ship software to test out things. Um, so this is another project that we, we might consider doing maybe this year, potentially next year, um, around getting our, our own testing infrastructure to a point where it is easy for somebody who's writing a new DHC to say, hey, you know what, I, I want to test out how this, this new, we, we think this thing works really well in simulation, we think it works really well in like our you know, 10,000 node tests or whatever in a cloud environment, but we want to test it out in the real world um, and get ourselves to a point where we can do this, where we can ship out and, and maybe make millions of virtual nodes um, across this network around the planet and then test it in earnest. And it's only when we do this that we'll be able to get things at scale to the, to the demands of you know, modern applications with billions of users. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, is research. So the, I, we tend to think a lot about um, you know, this pipeline of going from ideas through specs and coding and so on. Uh, and a lot of the P work is pushing the research boundaries and is pushing the frontiers of what we know about peer-to-peer -peer systems. And already today, we do a lot of stuff that we need to um, kind of inform the world about. So this might mean writing papers. Um, this might mean collaborations with, with other groups. Uh, there's an enormous amount of interest in peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized systems that goes all the way back to you know, late 90s and early 2000s, and in some cases, much further back. Um, but there's a lot, there was a lot of important activity happening across a bunch of universities in that time period. And that, a lot of that just fell flat. Uh, it was used in, in the early peer-to-peer -peer applications of the, um, in the, fir you know, the first peer-to-peer -peer wave. Um, but with the kind of, there's a whole bunch of reasons why, but there was effectively a peer-to-peer -peer winter and a lot of those, those groups stopped working on this stuff. But many of their, their implementations and solutions were extremely good. They just didn't get built. They died somewhere here, right? So a lot of the really good peer-to-peer -peer ideas and things that are going to make peer-to-peer -peer systems scale are just you know, stuck in the ideas or, or, or paper domain where there were great results achieved and then those groups moved on to other things. So it's time for us to go and, and figure out what those might be and, and bring them in, like actually get, get them to a point where we can use them. And in other, sense, in other places, it's connecting with the people that were doing that work and saying, hey, we now have a good structure to build and test all of these things. And you know, yes, the end-to-end -end principle got violated when we like, made the TCP uh, and UDP protocols be like, the only things. And like, you, know, you couldn't really make new transfer protocols. But we're, we're working on like, fixing that. And like, now it, with lip 2 p you can totally deploy a new transfer protocol. And you don't have to worry about um, you, know, you just overlay it over UDP. And it, you, know, you can build applications on top of it. So all of that kind of stuff can revive an enormous amount of activity in all of those groups. Uh, because if we give them an easy way to test out implementations and then ship them into real live uh, applications, um, that's going to generate a ton of activity in this world. And so this is something we should think about this in the next coming quarters and set ourselves up for in 2019 uh, hitting really well. Uh, and by the way, it's never quite linear, right? Like it's always very messy connectivity here. Uh, another thing is you know, addressing the needs of downstream projects. So this means figure out what all the downstream projects needs. Uh, so part of, that's part of the goal of this event, uh, to understand what, uh, as a user of LibVP, what do you need out of it? Uh, and you know, build a, a registry, to, registry to track those use cases and needs and so on. Um, so that when we tackle those things uh, in, a, in a quarterly basis, we figure out what to, um, what to prioritize and what to do. And, uh, Another thing I want to talk about is, is scaling up development. So we already started to form working groups. We want to uh, double down on that. We want to start measuring what we're doing right and wrong there. Uh, better planning and scheduling and all that kind of stuff, uh, increasing the resources. We are doing things like the Journal Club, for example. I think we covered Coral. We covered a few other things uh, that are re relevant to peer-to-peer. -to -peer. Um, if you want to get involved in that, please do. And uh, I wanted to touch on how to um, speed up our development. So I think 
different from other sy systems like IPFS and others where a lot of the system is, it needs to be highly integrated. Um, other than the lib2p core or kernel, you don't really have to think very much about um, syncing with other groups while you're building, building an independent implementation um, of a subset of these, these protocols. So you know, each of these things can, can proceed in parallel uh, and kind of follow its own, um, own timeline and often doesn't require the context of understanding of getting everything else. Um, so instead of thinking of Lifted to be advancing as a you know, unit uh, with you know, a group of people having to have high context and everything, it's really a bunch of little modules advancing at their own rate. Um, and once you know, some of them reach a certain level of completion, then they get pulled into like, the, the, implement, the working implementations. Um, so this suggests that we can you know, organize our work around these things much better in that we could, we could describe things like, hey, we need a Bluetooth transport, and here's what it needs to look like, here's the interface it needs to match, um, and then kind of put that out as a, as a project description that, that needs to happen. And then people that want that thing or that might be good at building that thing can just focus on that and not have to worry about all the rest of the stuff. Um, that's mostly documentation and project management stuff that, that we haven't uh, gotten there with. But I think if we set ourselves up in Discord to do this, then um, we're going to be able to scale the, the development pretty dramatically. And, and you can think of this as becoming also RFP worthy stuff where we can say, you know what? We really need um, a visual transport because I want to like aim two phones at each other, and like visual like QR codes is like the only thing that like I can use in this crazy setting. But I don't really have the time to go do this, so I'm gonna like yeah hire um, some other group that can do this that doesn't know that much about lip P necessarily, but um, have a well scoped enough project that they can dive into the code and, and build that one thing and then. Uh, and then go off. And I think this, if we if we do this well, then we can scale the development of all this stuff um, very effectively in the next in the coming year. Uh, so you know, here are some ideas of working groups we might we might form. There's more, uh, but things like testing and visualization, um, testing here being like large scale network testing, and then starting to think about use cases. So lipid lipid for blockchains, lipid for browsers, OSs, file systems, mobile. There's other things there. Those are five that I think are. Um, high in my mind. And uh, we're, we're going to be trying out a, a thing around uh, projects. And I think Mike will touch on this more later, but, um, or, or I don't know if we will, but uh, I'll just mention it now. This idea of just scoping, scoping up things like that Bluetooth transport into a well-defined um, work package. That's not a great word. We're gonna, project is a better word. Into a well-defined project that describes all the different things that would have to happen, like different modules and maybe different languages, um, dealing with certain libraries or maybe having to write a library and so on. And then we'll have kind of like a registry of these projects um, that we think are important to do. And then that will allow us to prioritize and say, you know what, like all these downstream users really need um, you know, I2P or something or really need Bluetooth. So we need to like lift, this, lift up this project and maybe it's an RFE, maybe we just resources it internally or, or whatever. Um, but getting to that, that kind of like project management uh, structure will, will, again, help us paralyze and scale the development process where because all of the lib P2P modules are, are, are so many, you, you don't need, a lot of people working on, the, on some specific things won't need all that context. And so this is why we're doing, this is why we're experimenting with this kind of structure. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention is, hey, we should have a lot of fun, damn it. Uh, a, a lot of us uh, hack on these things because it's pretty awesome to do some of the stuff, like being able to build like a, create a network in the browser that could, um, you know, have millions of browsers connected to each other and have, you know, playing a game or something. Um, that kind of awesome hacks, um, I think we need to do more of. Lip P2P is now at a point to support that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I love seeing like random things like this, where you know somebody will post a link and it'll be like this crazy, um, you know, test out a DHT implementation, like, and you leave your browser open and you know starts doing a bunch of requests, and you can maybe you can visualize the network, and, and this is a way that we can get also a lot more people engaged and um, and and thinking about the the cool things that can happen with these these systems. So I think we should just put a bit more time and effort into into letting you know doing this kind of stuff. Like it's um, uh, wow, it sounds like I'm saying, hey, work hard on having fun, uh, but but really it's just about celebrating more what what we're doing and uh, yeah, telling the world about it. Uh, all right, so I think that, and, and I wanted to touch on kind of what protocol, so we're thinking through how do we interface, like there's like the project and then there's organizations that are doing work with the project. 
Um, here's like an example of like what protocol labs, uh, uh, what protocol priorities might be, or as, if you think of that as a working group, um, what we want to want to do in the short term. So you know, recruit full-time engineers that can work on the P2P as a whole. Um, things uh, there are certain features and requirements uh, around PubSub and so on that will be really useful for for Falcon and other projects as well. Um, and so we'll you know focus on that kind of stuff. And then security audits, like that's something that we want to do across the networking stack. Uh, yeah, great. That's that's it. You have any questions? Or I don't know if we have time for questions. I think we have one minute for questions. Hi, Juan. Um, I have a question about, I guess, just the P2P and IPFS like, philosophy. Um, you know, David talked about um, the P2P being like a location, oh, sorry, no, content addressed uh, system instead of a location addressed system. Um, do you guys see uh, a way to kind of still attach location addressing somehow into the system, or is this kind of just like think? Uh, we're we're going to try to think about things from a completely different standpoint that, you know, the things that we think about today as if like geolocation and, and you know, pops or like things like that aren't really like a good paradigm to think about things anymore. So I guess is the question, um, are we open to exploring new kinds of ways of doing networking where you're doing the addressing by other things like, yeah, like geolocality or something like that? Um, those sound awesome and interesting, and we should explore them. No question. Uh, I think what uh, where we're at now is the the core lowest level of P 2 P. Like, why is it a why is it a circuit switch thing and not a packet switch thing? It's a circuit switch thing because in 2014, 15, um, it was quite difficult to think about doing packet switching in the browser or packet switching um, in a bunch of contexts where. Uh, NATs and all this uh, firewalls and middle boxes and so on prevent anything that isn't TCP over IP or UDP over IP um, or like you know TLS uh, and and you know Quick had to like bust through that but a ton of other product uh, protocols failed like SDP and so on so so in that world we had to think of like saying okay great like we have to layer stuff over these these protocols that exist now and start piping our stuff over all of that and just for simplicity that should be a circuit switch network to begin with. But packet switching is like is coming, right? And so um, similarly, other kinds of networking ideas, like perhaps some of the content-centric networking stuff or content-addressed networking stuff that uh, from NDN and and other, uh, you know, XIA. I don't know if you've heard about these systems, but they're all reimaginings of if you were to build the internet today like from scratch, like the the if you were to redesign the network layer of the internet, like the IP layer of the internet. Would you do it by just doing these process address or, or these host addresses, or would you do it with something completely different? And um, we should absolutely explore that kind of stuff. Uh, I think it would be that's kind of like a track, and that would be kind of a working group idea. If there's enough people interested, we can form those kinds of working groups. Um, uh, but it, yeah, it'll be demand driven as opposed to um, you know explicitly forcing forcing ourselves to go in that direction. Um, a prior a big priority for us is to. You know, Lipitor is already used by a lot of groups, and so we want to get, we want to make sure that the the a, a large amount of our bandwidth goes into supporting those those users. Um, but uh, yeah, we should explore that. Okay, awesome talk. Thank you, Vaughn. Um, Thank you. I know there's probably.